Um, so I'm here today with Rob Copeland, Professor Rob Copeland from Sheffield Hallam University um, and uh, we're going to be having a chat about physical activity and leadership um, and uh, Rob has very kindly um, spared a bit of time in between meetings to have a chat with us today. Um, so Rob I wondered if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about you and your background uh, and maybe a bit about the work that you're involved in in Sheffield at the moment. Yeah sure, so um, I'm a professor of physical activity and health here at Sheffield Hallam University, part of the Centre for Sport and Exercise Science, which covers everything from elite sport right through to broad population health research, really. Um, my background's in um, psychology and sport and exercise science, so I did an undergraduate in sport science, and then did a master's in sport and exercise medicine, and then a conversion course in psychology, and then a PhD in psychology. So it's been a long journey, I guess, if you like, and I've been here for about 15 years working in sport exercise and physical activity. The project that I'm involved in now is called the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine and that's an Olympic legacy project from London 2012. There's a centre here in Sheffield, there's one in East Midlands and then there's also one in London and we come together to try and I guess, tackle some of the wicked problems um, that we face in, in society particularly around non-communicable chronic disease, so lifestyle uh, related diseases that particularly physical activity can have a very positive impact on, both in terms of preventing those diseases, but also in terms of treating those um, diseases and supporting people into better quality of life who are living with those conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that project brings together a whole host of different disciplines, so research, exercise specialists, physiotherapists, um, you know, secondary care, primary care, community, voluntary sectors, we're all involved in this, in this key question really and mm -hmm. how we influence the, the system of, of, uh, of society to mm -hmm. make it easier for people to be active. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank yeah. you. And you've got um, a, a kind of vehicle for making that happen in Sheffield under the umbrella of, of Move More, haven't you? And yeah. a, that's a, a physical activity for physical activity strategy for Sheffield. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So um, I guess the big idea for Sheffield um, is that we want to transform the city into the most active city in the UK by 2020. You know, what I found is that if you if you want to um, engage uh, different sectors, if you want to engage, engage leaders across the system, you've got to have a big vision. Mm -hmm. You've got to have something that they will say, yeah, that sounds that sounds great. And actually, you know, what? the bigger and the more sort of unrealistic and all the rest of it, you know, the better. Just to get people enthused and emotionally engaged in, mm -hmm. in the discussion, and then you can work out some of the details. So our big big idea is to transform Sheffield into the most active city. And um, we've done that under the banner Move More because, you know, whilst I love the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine, if you try and say that to people, that they immediately glaze over. Whereas if you say it's about moving more, people get it. Um, and so what we've done with that project is look at the system that influences people's behaviour. And we've said we want to make changes in all aspects of that system. So the physical environment within which people live and exist and commute to work and um, uh, at recreation time and home time and all that sort of stuff. We want to change the physical environment. But then we also want to change the, the social environment, the policy environment, mm -hmm. to reinforce some of the behaviours and um, enhance some of the beliefs that we want to see happen. We also have um, the workplace, and that includes the NHS as a workplace, um, as a specific context of interest to say, well, how can we make it easier for people at work to be physically active? How can we create workplaces to support that? And what programs can we deliver within those workplaces to you know, motivate people and support them? We've got the same philosophy in schools um, as well as out there in, in, in the community. And collectively, we, you know, what we try to do is to say, okay, if we're, going to, if we're going to achieve this vision, we've got to make ground, we've got to influence each area of that system collectively and together. So we have described it before as like a balloon. And if you push on different parts of that balloon, you only have a small influence for the amount of time that you're pushing that bit of the balloon. But if you squeeze the whole thing together, you can have quite a dramatic impact on, on that balloon and that shape. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to squeeze the balloon, if you like, this Sheffield, and make it.
much easier for people to be active. So that's mm. the kind of philosophy behind it. Mm. Well, that's a really good analogy of the, the kind of system-wide approach that, that we're looking for. Uh, and um, and as you and I know, Rob, Sheffield's a really interesting city in that, that there's real health inequalities across the, yeah. the city, aren't there? So yeah. Yeah. Uh, some are areas that are very affluent and some areas that are really quite deprived. So the challenges across the city um, vary, don't they, in terms of what we're trying to yeah. achieve with it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not a one size fits all in terms of engaging with those communities. And some will require uh, more intensive and different kinds of support. But I think what's really important is that we, um, you know, we, we focus across the system. We don't just focus on the areas of high health inequality mm-hmm. and identify that as a specific group that we throw all our resources in. Because what the emphasis tells us is that actually we need to work across the system. So we try and raise you know, the whole population of mm-hmm. you can do that, we create a social norm around activity mm-hmm. that brings everyone up. So, you know, this term proportional universalism, you know, is kind of the, the, the thinking behind this to mm-hmm. say we need to do bits in all sectors and we might need a greater proportion of investment in some groups, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't invest in others as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've tried to we've tried to do that in Sheffield by linking in with our partners in the local authority and the voluntary and uh, the leisure sector to say maybe some of your groups actually who you're working with out in the communities how can we support you better um, how can we give you the resources the, uh, the information the skills to be able to do what you do really, really well mm. that's very face-to-face intensive face versus maybe a social marketing campaign mm. for people in a different demographic mm. who interact with that Mm. Much lower intensive, but it's the same message across mm. the population. Yeah, from lots of different angles. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, uh, one thing I'm really keen that physiotherapists start to think about is um, yeah. uh, there's always a big focus for physios on um, one-to-one interactions and interventions in terms of increasing physical activity, and we've got such a lot of. Um, natural opportunities to have those um, interactions with patients that it's a very obvious one Um, but in addition to kind of getting that right with patients I'm really keen that physios start to think about things like school interventions, workplace health, um, active travel and the whole kind of built environment and how that supports physical activity or or doesn't um, and community inventions, campaigns etc. Where where do you see physiotherapists sitting into that well fitting into that kind of system-wide approach that you've talked about? Yeah, I mean, I mean my, my experience in, in Sheffield is that, um, you know, as a profession, you've got a real deep and broad insight into the benefits of physical activity across a range of different populations and patient groups. Um, and my experience is that you're generally a fairly creative group as well in terms of being able to work with people and, mm. and, and engage people in activity. And, and so if we can get physios that are, are willing to leave for the profession and say, do you know what, actually we have a role in working with the leisure sector or mm-hmm. the, the local authority sector to be able to help you design programmes or engage communities, that's one opportunity that they can do. There's also bits around how do we feed and provide information, evidence base mm-hmm. for commissioners of activity, mm-hmm. for you know, people that make these commission decisions based on X, Y or Z information. And physios are a really good source of, you know, empirical data mm. in terms of what works. Mm. And I don't think we necessarily tap into uh, that often enough. Mm. Um, and the voice, because you carry with you the, uh, the sort of credibility of the medical profession, mm. an allied health profession, into that conversation, I think that's an important source of influence when we're trying to change commissioners and uh, redirect existing funds to support physical activity. Mm. So I think there's opportunities across that system, both from influencing commissioners by providing the right sorts of information, through to helping be creative and design programmes that will elicit health benefit, because you have such a great understanding of the impact of, of exercise mm. and rehabilitation on the body, and, and mm. you probably need to use that resource a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Um, particularly with... Um, Thinking with kids, and mm-hmm. I think there's probably a there's probably an aspirational bit here as well as a profession. It's held in you know in esteem if you go into into, into schools and what have you. And so having someone with a as a physiotherapist or a, a medic or a, even an academic a bit further down the chain, um, talking to kids and saying, "Well, oh, we're interested in this. This is important. We know who gives the message makes a difference to the impact with which it's received." And so we perhaps shouldn't lose sight of that. Mm. Um, when we're thinking about the, the, the different professions that mm. have an impact on. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
that, that that's really helpful. And I think there's, there's quite a lot of evidence to support um, the fact that physios as healthcare professionals are very credible messengers. And so I think yeah. that's that's a real um, a real yeah. bonus for us. So you know, it's a really important um, important thing that we need to remember. And I think it's a very good point that you made about collecting data and what data we collect and what what we then do with it as well. I think there's um, a lot of improvements that we can make there. Yeah. Um, so so just to finish up, Rob, is there anything, any final bits of advice or information that you would um, like to give to physios around the globe about um, their role in promoting physical activity? Yeah, I'm not one for advice. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I've been given a, a, few, a few thoughts on it. Um, I, I think one of the things, and this isn't just for, for physios, but it probably applies, is thinking about the broader context, I think physios do as well, the broader context of the individual, and the, the skills that they have in perhaps challenging the individuals to think beyond just the rehabilitation of a specific part of the body, and you know, working with people to say, okay, well how does this fit within mm -hmm. the broader context of life, what does that look like for that person, and thinking outside of that rehabilitation sort of mm. um, arena, if you like. Because I think if we start to encourage people and professionals broadly to think about how they can influence the system beyond their specific encounter with people, we and we start to model that, and we start to say, you know, I walked to, to, to work this morning, mm. or I do this or that or the other. Because of the, um, the credibility that the profession has with giving those messages, if they're consistent, mm we've got a much better chance of influencing a larger number of people. Mm. And so perhaps broadening the view and thinking that physiotherapists is not just, um, and I don't, I'm not saying they do think of themselves like this, but I guess it's a challenge to say to what extent do we think the influence of the profession is across the broad system mm. of activity mm. and not just a narrow NHS system yeah, yeah. or healthcare system elsewhere in the world. So that would be my, my first point. I think probably the second point I'll be saying is, is collaborate and bring your expertise into a broader sphere mm -hmm. and outside the healthcare system. I think there's so much to offer in education, in the workplace, um, in academia, in voluntary sector that we could benefit from, mm -hmm. um, not just the, uh, the NHS yeah. um, system. Um, and then probably lastly is, um, is this, this idea I mentioned before about modelling. Mm -hmm. And all of us, whether we're physiotherapists, whether we're academics, whether we're Supporters, whatever we're professional, we, are, we model it. We lead from the front and say, you know what, this is something that I do. This is mm -hmm. because it's what I believe to be um, you know, a, a good thing in terms of quality of life and health and well-being. I think mm -hmm. we've got a much better chance of others doing it. Mm -hmm. If we don't do it and we're not modelling it, I think it's very, very difficult for us to um, have any credibility in mm -hmm. asking others to do it. So there's probably a personal challenge in there to say how how are we modelling that. There's a professional challenge. Um, and then there's probably a scope to say, are we thinking broad enough around our, our influence? Mm. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I really liked um, something you said earlier about when you're trying to get people engaged and, and in on your mission, uh, making it really, um, really bold and really brave and really big, uh, but also keeping it very simple. I think those were really important messages for, for physios when they're trying to engage people. I think maybe uh, maybe we're not brave enough with, with some, of our, some of our aspirations sometime as well. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think what we found is what the psychologists what we understand around behavior changes and you've got to um, garner both the logical reason for doing something mm. the good idea mm. with the emotional reason for doing it and you know as a social psychologist in the states Jonathan Haidt talks about this relationship between the logical side of your, of your brain if you like and the emotional side and he describes it like a rider on top of an elephant and that your logical part of your brain is the riders and you want to go in this direction this is a good idea and then the emotional part of you, which is described as the elephant, is going, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, and you know, if you're having a battle of wills between those two, it doesn't mm. give you one winner. So we've got to engage people emotionally, by making it fun or personally relevant to yeah. you, or aspirational, as well as saying, and if you do this, there will be X, Y, or Z benefits, yeah. or you'll avoid A, B, and C consequences. Yeah. And I think in that dialogue, having a bigger vision, saying we're part of something that's beyond me, is, is often helpful. Mm. Um, to engage people emotionally, so that's part of the thinking behind it. And that's the idea. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah, brilliant. Oh, well, that's been really, really yeah. interesting chatting to you, and thanks ever so much for um, giving Pleasure. up a bit of time to, to do that today, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.